applications for which ocular ultrasound can be used. Let's first look at uh, some exam essentials. You're going to want to make sure that you use a high frequency linear transducer since you're going to be interrogating a superficial structure. Uh, you want to make sure that the patient is cooperative. You're going to use a fair amount of ultrasound gel so that you do not apply pressure uh, on the globe and the, the exam can be done with the patient in the supine position. The eye is going to be scanned in both the sagittal and the transverse uh, planes. In the sagittal plane, you're going to place the indicator towards uh, the top of the patient's head. On the transverse, you're going to have the indicator pointed towards the patient's right. You're going to use um, uh, ultrasound gel. I tend to use uh, Surgilube when performing this because it's uh, sterile. You're going to want to avoid applying pressure to the globe, and you uh, want to limit overall uh, scanning time. Lastly, I think it's important to mention here that if you have somebody that you have a high index of suspicion has a ruptured globe and any potential for uh, leaking of uh, aqueous humor, you do not want to perform the exam on these patients and you want to obtain emergent uh, ophthalmology consultation on these patients first. Let's first look at the normal eye. This is a transverse view of the eye. Uh, so you have the transducer anterior, posterior, patient's right, patient's left. Here you have the anterior chamber. Here you have the lens. So this is going to be the posterior chamber back here. And back here you have the retina. Note that uh, under normal circumstances, you're not going to be able to distinguish the retina from the other uh, choroidal layers unless there's de detachment present. And here you have the optic nerve. So you get a very good look at both the anterior and posterior chambers with ocular ultrasound. Here's a video sweep through the eye in the transverse plane. Again, you can see the anterior chamber the lens, the posterior chamber, and intermittently as you sweep through it, you can see the optic nerve in the back right here. Um, note that the posterior chamber is anechoic. You have to make sure that when you are doing your machine settings that you've got the gain maximized. If you have the gain set too low, it'd be very easy to miss small amounts of vitreous hemorrhage. So you want to make sure you turn that gain up till you see artifactual fill in and then turn it back. This way you'll know that you've got your gain maximized and you're not going to miss any small amounts of vitreous hemorrhage. Let's first look at vitreous hemorrhage. The vitreous is an avascular structure. Now vitreous hemorrhage is going to be extravasation of blood due to normal diseased or abnormal new retinal vessels, trauma, or extension of hemorrhage from another source. The most common cause of vitreous hemorrhage will be due to a posterior vitreous detachment with or without retinal tear. Vitreous hemorrhage will appear sonographically as echogenic debris within the uh, you know, posterior chamber. Here you can see kind of a lacy web-like um, fill-in within the posterior chamber here due to uh, vitreous hemorrhage. It can be confused with retinal detachment on a static exam because frequently it can layer posteriorly. And like I said, it's important that you have your gain set maximally because it's very easy to miss small amounts of vitreous hemorrhage. But as you look through the posterior chamber here, you can see that there are abnormal echoes within there and this is due to the presence of vitreous hemorrhage in this patient. Here's another patient who on transverse scanning through the eye has a small amount of echoes within the uh, uh, posterior chamber due to the presence of vitreous hemorrhage. This patient also had a very small uh, posterior vitreal detachment as the cause for this. There's an advantage to doing dynamic scanning where you have the patient look from side to side. When they have a vitreous hemorrhage, 
particularly when you see the echogenic uh, uh, debris within the posterior chamber and it layers very close uh, posteriorly and, and you're not certain whether it's a posterior vitreal detachment or a retinal detachment, by having the patient look from side to side, you can see the hemorrhage, if, it was a vit if it's a vitreous hemorrhage, as in this case, you can see that it's freely swirling around. You won't see that type of movement with a posterior vitreous or a retinal detachment. Let's now look at posterior vitreous detachments. Um, they're a degenerative process of the vitreous, and as we get older, the vitreous gel loses its attachment to the membrane. Sonographically, these are going to appear as thin, smooth membranes, and they may mimic ret retinal detachments um, with B scanning, which is what we perform with ultrasound. Um, by having the patient move from side to side, you will end up seeing some movement with a posterior vitreous detachment as opposed to a retinal detachment where the membrane appears thicker. Um, you would also notice with a posterior vitreous detachment that as you uh, decrease the gain, it tends to disappear quicker than you would expect a retinal detachment to do. But to be honest, in the beginning, as you do these scans, it may be difficult for you to distinguish between a posterior vitreous detachment and a retinal detachment. The important thing is to recognize these echogenic band-like structures posteriorly and to recognize the vitreous hemorrhage so that you can refer the patient appropriately. Now here's a patient with a uh, PVD. Um, you can see that it attaches posteriorly here and unlike a vitreous hemorrhage, which should be freely swirling. You can see that this is still attached posteriorly. It's a thinner um, echogenic band, and this was a patient with a uh, posterior vitreous detachment. Now, a retinal detachment is a separation of the retina from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. And as you can see, it can be due to a variety of causes. Um, that's really not going to be the important issue with us in the emergency department. Um, our goal is going to be to find the echogenic band posteriorly in the patient with uh, appropriate symptoms. Okay, now here we have a patient with a retinal detachment. You can see that there's a thick echogenic band posteriorly. You can see that there's vitreous hemorrhage present. And you can see that the uh, detachment is attached posteriorly to the optic disc. And on this patient, even if we turn the, the gain down to a lower setting, uh, this echogenic band was still present. This is a patient with a retinal detachment. Here we have the same patient with the retinal detachment, but here we're performing dynamic scanning by having the patient look from side to side. You can see that the echoes of the vitreous hemorrhage do move around as the patient looks from side to side, but you can see that that echogenic band has very little movement and it's still fixed posteriorly here by the optic nerve. So this is how dynamic scanning can be useful in evaluating these patients. So let's look at how you could potentially differentiate a retinal detachment from a posterior vitreous detachment. From a sonographic standpoint, let's first look at echogenicity. The posterior vitreous detachment is low to medium in terms of its echogenicity. So if we move down to here, as you decrease the gain to lower settings, the PVD will disappear but the retinal detachment has a high degree of echogenicity and will remain visible even with low gain. From a mobility standpoint, you saw on the previous scan of the uh, patient with the posterior vitreous detachment that while it was fixed posteriorly, there was uh, more movement than what you saw with the retinal detachment. And lastly, optic disc attachment is present or absent in posterior vitreous detachments, but it's always present with retinal detachments. Um, let's now take a look at choroidal detachments. These are common postoperatively, but can also be seen posttraumatically, as in the case shown here. Um, if you have a shallow choroidal detachment, meaning a small one, these can usually be treated non-operatively. However, the larger 
you know, called kissing or oppositional detachments are usually treated operatively but on a delayed basis. And the choroidal detachments will usually have a scalloped appearance. Here we have a patient who has um, a thick echogenic band here, which was the choroidal detachment. You can see the scalloped appearance to it. And you can see that there's some echogenic uh, uh, a fluid noted in the subcoroidal space. The patient has a very large amount of vitreous hemorrhage, and there's also an echogenic band here that was uh, felt to be a uh, retinal detachment, and this was all post traumatic. You can also note that the anterior chamber is relatively flattened, and this was all related to the trauma. This um, ultrasound was performed at the request of ophthalmology while they were at the bedside. Briefly, I want to just look at optic sheath nerve diameter since this is becoming a, a popular focus of study in the emergency medicine literature. Optic sheath nerve diameter correlates well with intracranial pressure. There were some earlier studies done on patients with pseudotumor cerebri, and it was noted that their optic sheath, sheath nerve diameter changed uh, real time um, after a therapeutic lumbar puncture with drainage was performed. The normal optic sheath nerve diameter is up to 5 millimeters in diameter in adults. It's, it should be measured about 3 millimeters posterior to the globe. This way you can get reproducible uh, um, numbers. And the uh, optic sheath nerve diameter is you know, greater than 5 millimeters is considered abnormal. And so this is something that you may want to consider in the patient that you have concern for elevated intracranial pressure. This now concludes the focused ocular ultrasound lecture.
I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture we're going to cover Achilles tendon sonography. Physical exam is not going to be reliable in ruling out complete or partial tendon ruptures of the Achilles tendon. Of note, approximately 20% of ruptures are going to be initially missed by the clinician. Fortunately, ultrasound is very accurate in diagnosing both complete and partial tendon tears. Looking specific, specifically at the Achilles tendon, it's the strongest tendon in the body, and it's formed by tendinous contributions of both the gastroc and soleus muscles. It's one of the most frequently injured tendons, and it's surrounded by a peritinon rather than a synovial sheath. Therefore, fluid is not normally seen adjacent to the tendon. Injuries to the Achilles tendon range from partial to complete tears. These tears normally are going to occur in the relatively avascular zone 2 to 6 centimeters above the calcaneal insertion. Rarely do they occur at the calcaneal insertion, which is where most people uh, would suspect that these injuries occur. I want to spend just a little bit of time going over the Thompson's test, since this is a well-described test dating back in the literature to 1957. You basically place the patient prone with their feet hanging off the exam table. If the tendon's intact, when you squeeze the calf, you get plantar flexion. The test is considered positive if the foot remains neutral or has only minimal plantar flexion when compared to the normal side. It's possible to have a false negative Thompson's test if the plantaris tendon is intact. Let's take a look at both a normal and an abnormal Thompson's test. This patient had a complete uh, rupture of the Achilles tendon on the left and we can we'll be able to show in a second here the abnormal and the normal Thompson's test. So here you can see that with squeezing of the calf in the affected leg that there's no plantar flexion that occurs and that's because of the rupture that occurred at about this level right here. So this is a positive test here. This is a comparison view on the normal side. And note the intact tendon here and note the plantar flexion with calf squeeze. The normal Achilles tendon will appear hyperechoic with a fibrillar echo texture. And these fibers are going to be best appreciated in the longitudinal plane like we see here. This is a sagittal scan. So the transducer is posterior on the Achilles tendon. The beam is going in an anterior direction. You've got head here. You've got foot here. So this is the insertion right here. And you can see as we move in a proximal direction, you can see the uh, um, fibrillar echo texture as we get up towards the calf here. This is a patient with a normal, intact Achilles tendon. Anisotropy is something that you have to be aware of when performing tendon ultrasound. Scanning a tendon at any angle other than perpendicular is going to result in a loss of that normal hyperechoic appearance. And this phenomena should not be confused with a tendon tear. If we take a look at this intact tendon here, you can see that by changing the angle of insonation that it appears that the tendon is now ruptured but by then getting back to close to a 90 degree angle, you can see the uh, uh, fibrillar echo texture reappear. So you want to be very careful when you're scanning to be aware of this phenomena. Fortunately, the Achilles tendon um, can be easily scanned at a perpendicular interface with the exception of the insertion site. So this usually is not a big problem with the Achilles tendon, but again, it's something that you need to be aware of. Here's a transverse view of the Achilles tendon right here, and notice that it becomes darker as we scan in a non-perpendicular angle. So even though it's less likely to happen with the Achilles tendon because of its nice flat uh, um, surface and the ability to scan perpendicular, if you do angle the transducer, then you can create this effect and potentially uh, uh, falsely diagnose a tendon injury when there is not one present. So let's look here one more time at a normal Achilles tendon. Here we've got sagittal, here we've got transverse. So here we're moving in a proximal direction and you can see that nice echogenic fibrillar texture as we move up into the calf muscle here. 
And this is what you want to see in a normal patient. Transverse, as we scan, you can see the nice echo texture here. It's a little more difficult to appreciate in the transverse plane. That's why we're going to be emphasizing the uh, sagittal plane. But again, both views should be uh, performed when evaluating the Achilles tendon. Now, tendinosis refers to hypoechoic fusiform swelling of the tendon without disruption. Now, this can be focal or diffuse, and it's thought to be a degenerative process. Here's a patient, a sagittal view of the Achilles tendon, and you can see that you've got a nice echogenic fibrillar appearance right here. But as you start moving here, in a more proximal direction, this is a sagittal image, you can see that there's hypoechoic fusiform swelling. There was no complete disruption here. This was a patient who had tendinosis. In patients with tendinosis, calcifications can also be seen. Again, here's a sagittal view of the Achilles tendon. Uh, you can see here some echogenic areas with posterior shadowing. These represent calcifications. But again, you can see Here's the echogenic fibrillar appearance of the Achilles tendon, but up here, you don't really appreciate that as well. There's some fusiform hypoechoic swelling here. This is a patient who had a calcific tendinosis. You can see where the tendon starts to become um, more swollen, and here's where the calcifications are. There was no evidence of rupture. This was a calcif uh, calcific tendinosis. Partial tears will be hypoechoic or anechoic areas within the tendon where the tendon is partially disrupted. And it may be difficult to distinguish low-grade partial tears from tendinosis. Um, dynamic evaluation can be done to assess for this. But here was a patient who had a partial tear of their Achilles tendon. This is a sagittal view. You've got head this way, foot this way posterior, anterior. Here you can see the only remaining part of the tendon that's intact. Here's some free fluid here. And you can see on the scanning, as the patient's uh, was a plantar flex, that this is the only part of the tendon that was intact. It probably represented about 25% of the uh, you know, full width of the tendon. Here's another example of a partial tear, and you can see as the patient's taken through dynamic scanning, there's only a very small band here that's still connected. There's some free fluid here, but this was a patient with a fairly significant partial tear of their Achilles tendon. Here's another patient with a uh, partial tear of their Achilles tendon. Note that the tendon on both sides, this is proximal, this is distal in a sagittal orientation, has an edematous appearance and this is all due to the uh, trauma, but here you can see where the tear is and it extends down to about here. So this patient has only about 25% of their tendon still connected and you can see here they're taken through a dynamic scan and this is the only remaining part down here that is still attached. Now here's an example of a complete tear. So with a complete tear, you're going to have complete disruption with tendon retraction. Now the torn edges will be tapered, and you may even see some posterior acoustical shadowing uh, present. And in some cases, that tendon gap is going to get filled with either hemorrhage or a portion of Kager's fat pad. It's important to uh, recognize what fills in the area between the complete disruption since operative versus non-operative management will be based on how the attendant will oppose in plantar flexion. And here you can see during plantar flexion that the tendon does not come together and that there's a significant amount of fat opposed between the two tendon borders. This would make non-operative management in this patient um, fairly unlikely to be successful. Here's another patient who has a complete tear here. You can see the distal end and the proximal end. There's a large amount of fat interposed here. 
And this, again, would be a patient that would not be a good candidate for non-operative management due to the amount of fat interposed, keeping the edges from coming together during plantar flexion. Here's a patient with a complete tear. You can see the proximal and distal edges. And you can see that there's really no um, fat interposed and no hemorrhage and that these edges are fairly well approximated. This was a patient who was managed with, who was managed non-operatively and actually did well. Here was a patient who had a equivocal Thompson's test, even though they had a complete Achilles tendon rupture, and that was because medially here, they had an intact plantaris tendon. So remember, the presence of an intact plantaris tendon, which is at the medial aspect of the Achilles tendon, may simulate an intact you know, Achilles tendon and cause a uh, false negative examination, which is what happened in this patient. What else do you have to consider when you have a patient who comes in with uh, posterior leg pain and you think may have an Achilles tendon rupture. Well, gastrocnemius muscle tears um, most commonly are um, injured at the medial head of the gastroc. It's often referred to as tennis leg and the tendon fibers are disrupted at the aponeurosis and this could mimic an Achilles tendon rupture but the treatment is going to be different. Here was a patient that came in uh, he was actually playing basketball and felt a tearing in the back of his leg and was swollen and so there was concern because of the pain down into this area that he had an Achilles tendon rupture. Here sagittally you can see the tear of the medial head at the aponeurosis and you can see the free fluid adjacent to the area here and now we're moving down towards the Achilles tendon. But you can see this tear of the medial head down by the aponeurosis here. And here's a transverse view. Again, you can see the free fluid here. And now we're moving up into the calf muscle. So this is a patient with a gastroc muscle tear, not an Achilles tendon rupture. This now concludes the Achilles tendon lecture.